session recorded last time. <laughs> yes. So go ahead. Carrie. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Stewart. I'm uh, zooming in from uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, I'm a member of the Allies for Racial Equity Steering Committee on the Education Resources Chair. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I'm also an independent consultant in intercultural communication. And uh, Donna. <laughs> Hi everyone, Donna Rinfro in the Woodlands, Texas, just north of Houston, uh, interim minister here, member of the ARE steering committee, uh, recording secretary. Um, I think that's enough. <laughs> And my name is Lori Stone Sertoski. I am here wearing two hats tonight. I am an incoming steering committee member for the UU Allies for Racial Equity, and I will be uh, taking over in uh, as treasurer in June uh, from when Ken uh, becomes the pre uh, co-president of ARE. I'm also here as a staff person and the director of technology for the Church of the Larger Fellowship, uh, which we're co-hosting um, with the CLF and ARE tonight, this webinar. Hi, so again, I'm Carolina Kravari Graham. I come to you from hot, hot, hot Arizona. Uh, and I am uh, the GA and conference coordinator for Allies for Racial Equity. Uh, we started last week, I'm hoping that a lot of you were there, um, talking about uh, eight of the qualities of white supremacy culture, according to Tema Okun's analysis. We're going to do seven and a little bit of a wrap up today. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of a feed forward to, so you know what's coming, because we kind of totally blindsided everybody by going out of order and skipping around last week. We will be covering quantity over quality. Progress is bigger, more power hoarding paternalism, only one right way, objectivity. Um, oops, worship of the written word is moved. We already moved it up, so that's way up, up top. And then we're gonna do a little bit of a wrap up. We're doing a conversational format. Two of the three of us are going to be in conversation around this. Uh, we welcome questions both during and afterwards. We're gonna give between five and eight minutes to each topic try and keep it loose and free and then kind of talk about the intersections as we transition to the next one and then uh and then we'll take you know more conversation and more questions in the end um we're gonna we're gonna try and get to it but i think one of the things we want to be mindful of is that we we'd rather be thorough and rather have deeper conversations than actually um, get through all of it. If we have to do another webinar, I think none of us are going to cry. Maybe Lori might cry. I don't know. So while the two of us are in conversation, um, the third one of us and Lori is going to be monitoring the chat feed, and we are also going to try and bring in questions or observations that we feel m might fit really well into that conversation um, into that. So with that, um, we are going to start um with quantity over quality and i ask you so i would actually like to know is it okay if i kind of introduce this with the premise we were talking about carrie and donna yep so somewhere where i cannot remember where i heard a really neat statistic <laughs> and that was that people were more apt to accept information if there were numbers attached to it so you could say something like most Arizonans really hate the sunlight and you could say something like 93.8 percent of all Arizonans really hate the sunlight and people would be more apt to believe the thing with the number in it um, regardless of how close those two pieces of information were 
and they're more likely to believe numbers that are numbers numbers as opposed to percentages or fractions or whatever. So, um, or not, yeah, not like, like whole numbers. So I think that that's so interesting to think about as we talk about the idea of white supremacy culture embracing the idea of quantity over quality. Right, and, um, and I also heard that 87.5% of statistics on the internet are made up. <laughs> um, so that's, that's definitely true. We are, um, part of white supremacy culture is a, uh, an, an inbred drive to produce things, right? Um, and so we're always looking towards, well, what are we achieving? Um, and uh, look at our agenda. Look at, our, at uh, General Assembly, for example. That's the thing that always gets to me. It's a jam-packed agenda. There's more than you could ever do, more than you could ever participate, and you're running from one event to the other. And um, yet we're a religious denomination that says we're in covenant with one another, and our relationships are important, but we don't build in time to develop those relationships. It's more about the number of things you do. Right, Donna? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. When Carolina told me that we were gonna start with quantity over quality, uh, it that was a change in where we'd been and with this percentage and I, I was like I think that's definitely a white person kind of <laughs> kind of statistic <laughs> Do we really okay yeah if we're talking mostly about power here in this uh, in this webinar we kind of think last week we talked a lot about fear and the subjects we're gonna cover this time are a lot about power and um, where white people draw it from. And definitely there's that quantity over quality. Um, that is a piece of it. So the one that, two things um, stick out for me, um, learning about how important relationship is um, to, um, a lot, 87.5, I don't know, um, percent of uh, people of color, um, you know, that, that that's more important in building the relationship. And so um, there's also in, in there's the way of not paying attention to emotions and feelings when you just stay right there with the information um, that I just think is crucial and all the way through here. Right, <clears throat> taking time out to focus on emotions or feelings of whatever topic is or whatever you're addressing um, is definitely an area we white folks tend to avoid. <laughs> Um, and as well as, you know, glossing over conflict when, when we're in conversation or, or even just, you know, what some folks might just term disagreement. Um, we don't like to engage in that. Um, one, it makes us uncomfortable and two, it impedes the progress of whatever it is we're trying to get to whatever objective, right? So, um, people's feelings can get roughshod, run over, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. We see that meetings a lot um, it's more important to get the agenda done than to see what comes up and to off, work on that yeah to check off those items and uh and people get confused about how the process is it just as important as whatever items are on the agenda you know it's how we do the work not just doing the work yes i have a question for you i I'm almost certain that the, the vast, 87.3 percent of you have sat in on a budget meeting. Um, I'm kind of making the assumption that quite a few of us are involved in church. Um, and I was just wondering whether or not in those budget discussions, where obviously everything is very, very quantitative, if anybody here had ever heard 
conversation around the quality of what we are producing in our mission, in our ministries, within the budget conversation. So I'm curious if anybody wants to raise their hand if they had heard such a conversation or if you might have maybe been frustrated by not hearing such a conversation. Well, until someone's ready to talk, I'll jump right in because I just uh, started my first pledge drive as a minister, as a solo minister last um, weekend. And um, boy, it was so clear to me that we do our budgets around bare minimum numbers and they are not aspirational according to what difference we want to make in the world to what our mission is um so that's just really big for me right now yeah and um what comes up for me are those um pledge drives that talk about having like the cottage meetings and when we talk about having conversations you know and people will ask for feedback about how they feel the church is doing or how the congregation is for them and, uh, you know, and then you, ask, you do the ask, right? You ask for the pledge. And we always get the report on the numbers, but we don't get a lot of feedback <laughs> and process through, right, about what people are saying their experiences were. Um, I'd like to jump in. This is Anne. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. I have a lot of experience with this, not, not in a, a church environment, but in a business environment, and spent a number of years as the total quality management facilitator for a, a company, a multi-million dollar company, that, that had a vision and a mission. And all of the business's performance measures aligned with that vision and mission. And one of its goals was to build customer intimacy so that key to the business's performance measures were customer satisfaction. And all of the financial measures and all of the process efficiency measures were linked up to those strategic goals that had to do with quality of relationship and customer satisfaction. And it was a very high performing business as a result of that. And I know that that can be done, but then you run the risk of getting stuck in this mindset that you have to achieve just specific goals and how you measure. And so I think there's a lot to be learned in terms of, of ensuring that you're aligning everybody to a vision um, that, doesn't, that, that, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be expensive. And financial management can still be financial management that can link with what is ultimately a, a mission or a vision driven orientation as long as you're measuring the right things. That's awesome. I have a question. How did it feel to work in an environment like that that seems relatively different from other corporate environments? Well, um, one of the things that we did was um, survey employees every year and align we, we analyze employee satisfaction information and p employee engagement information with customer satisfaction and customer engagement information and could show that the more people understood the vision and the mission, the more they were happy to help figure out how to do it right the first time and make sure customers were happy. And it sounds um, profitability happened as a result of good performance instead of good performance happening as a result of focusing on profitability. Everybody's performance measures were linked to something other than dollars. And the business was very profitable and employee satisfaction was also very high and turnover relative to other industry, other businesses in the same industry was about 16% of normal. It was really a happy workforce. And and Anne, was this documented? Yes. In a, in a report? Um, so I don't know if you've all heard of the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award, um, mm -hmm. but this is a business that won two of those awards. Oh. And 
there, there are criteria for managing organizations that the Baldrige program puts together for educational organizations and nonprofits. And I know that churches have used them. But I don't want to take a lot of time because this is getting us sort of off topic, but I'm happy to talk about it offline. It's actually a good, it's actually a good segue. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, the thing that I want to say about it, too, is that we in um, the steering committee of Allies for Racial Equity, one of the things that we talk about a lot is how to engage more people in um, this process. And I think that really what we're doing in this new format and what we're trying out is to engage people more in the process instead of trying to get more members. Um, so we really appreciate you being here trying out this new way with us. So Carrie, you were saying this was a good segue into the next topic. Yeah. Um, and I think I can say one of the things, the next topic is worship of the written word, which also has to do with documentation um, and quantifying and et cetera. And one of the things we talked about when we wanted to do this, this in a video web format, right? Because we could release all this just in writing, right? <laughs> um, was to do something that kind of challenged our acceptance of always writing being the thing, right? I mean, we deal a lot with writing. So Carrie, take it away, because I know you have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, okay, uh, am I on top for this one or? No, Carolina, <laughs> it's you and me. <laughs> My bad, <No>. sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. I was ready to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, Absolutely, the being able to write persuasively um, and have it where people can see it um, is a way of keeping a distance and not being able to have as much process and emotion. It's hard to get emotion in the written word. Um, you can count them, but it's hard to do that more. Um, so, Carolina, you want to jump on that? I have, I have, a, I have so much to say. Um, <laughs> so Surprise. One of the things, and this goes a little bit into something I think that Temo Kuhn doesn't cover too much, but I think in other conversations that are similar, um, we talk about things like hero worship and demonization and that we really ought not do either one. Um, uh, but I, I have noticed in virtually every single environment um, that people who write well or who articulate their thoughts well um, and, and emotions too, but who are very literary, let's say, are preferred and generally privileged within an organization. And sometimes good writing skills don't always include like don't always equate with good leadership um, some people can be very very eloquent and and not um, not be very good relational communicators maybe they can um, they can communicate information really well and really powerfully I mean I love I love a power sermon like just like everybody like the next person right like 83% of the people I love a power sermon um, but I've recognized that um, that being able to communicate information well does not necessarily equal being able to communicate within relationship well and I have found so often that people, a lot of maybe introverts, uh, who aren't going to be the life of the party and who aren't going to be very eloquent maybe because they choose to be quieter, get kind of tossed under the table when sometimes within the church community, they are the ones who are keeping relationships alive within, within our community, generally throughout struggle, right, and throughout difficult times. They tend to be more the heart, you know, of, of what's going on 
but then all accolades and all hero worship goes to the people who can speak well or write well. And I feel that that's really dangerous in relational work. And this is relational work. Um, we need to think about other ways of communicating, um, including nonverbal ways. I think we don't pay enough attention. You know, I, I don't do this as a joke. Um, between 60 and 80 percent, statisticians say, <laughs> of communication is nonverbal. And there are people who are powerful nonverbal communicators um, who can sometimes set a tone or make us feel safe. And I think we need to pay attention to that. Um, when we are trying to build a healthy, anti-racist, anti-oppressive community. Um, so that's kind of like, it again goes to a quality thing, like the quality of people's experiences, you know, as opposed to, um, I don't know, the number of experiences. <laughs> so this kind of leads, I think, leads kind of into uh, one of the things that always troubled me is, uh, and this is a, a factor of capitalism, it's a factor of our society, is that we have learned from very, very young age that the one with the most toys in the end wins. And our idea of progress is more, which ties back into quantity over quality as well. If we have more people in our pews last week, if we have more people, Lori, I want you to count now how many how many people we have in this webinar, um, <laughs> so we can we can see how effective we are. Um, I th think that a lot of people are really really focused <clears throat> on increase, 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 and I think if we look at the natural world, um, like un unfettered growth is unsustainable and sometimes contraction is necessary um, for healthy organizations. Right. Carolina, you're talking, I think, about numerical growth and um, uh, yes. that is kind of leading into uh, the progress is bigger and more. Um, I went back and looked at that, that we talk about growth almost always in numerical and, um, you know, there's a fabulous resource, which I think I have up on my computer. I'm not sure that I'll be able to put it, paste it in, um, about the four kinds of growth, about maturational and organic and incarnational and numerical. I'm curious, how many people have heard those terms in working? Yeah. Um, we do it a lot, I think, in our churches. Um, and I don't think that we do it, uh, that we pay attention as much in our relationships. You know, that growth is, in um, wisdom and in strength and um, and being out in the world, those are as important as raw numbers. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the things I I like about Okun's article is that the first thing she puts up is seventh generation thinking. Right. And to go back to last week, you know, we live in this kind of very individualistically oriented culture. We don't really think of the, the larger whole, much less the longer view. Um, so one of the things that we've we've done um, in small organizations that I've been a part of, um, all of them are consensus driven, is we try and really, really think about you know, the decisions that we're making now, um, number one, who, who are we listening to, right? Um, and number two, what will this mean in a year, in five years, in 10 years? And then we start really thinking about, I think we think about the importance of what we're doing with a new perspective. And in looking at it as, let's say, foundational to where you wanna go with your work, maybe it might become more important. 
and it might become a whole lot less important, right? So um, I think that that I think we are one of the things too. We were talking about that these are kind of power driven, um, but all of these, uh, and I know that I've had conversations with Carrie about it is that these are also scarcity driven, right? Because power and scarcity are interlinked. So um, I think about like, we're, we're thinking just of this year or you know making budget for this year and not really thinking in a sustainable way um, where if every year you're scrambling to make budget, right? Maybe start thinking about is, are the people who are coming after you going to be doing the same thing? Um, and to think a little bit more in the terms of sustainability um, and accountability to the people who are coming afterwards. So that's one of the things I try really, really hard to do. So, um, so I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything we haven't covered. Does anybody have, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. I try to multitask. Although it's not my job, I'm just looking if there's anything in the chat feed. Don't, that, I, I got my eye on the chat. Don't worry. Okay. Um, I know, and I went away a little bit trying to get uh, the the link up on UUA, but if you go to UUA about um, and type in numbers, different types, uh, you'll find that, um, the organizational. So the thing that keeps coming up for me, Carolina, and where we were is um, that progress is not in numbers, but progress is in deepening. Progress mm -hmm. is not in higher always, but wider, um, I think is a goal. <laughs> a goal we want. And it's, it's related to quality over quantity rather than the reverse, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can start as a solution to these issues. We can start really thinking about the questions we ask one another, right? Um, if we start asking more and more, and I've seen this actually recently in surveys um, around justice issues that people are starting to ask more qualitative questions. Um, but if we ask one another qualitative questions um, and emotional questions about to kind of try and get us out of our headspace a little bit. Um, so I think, I'm just thinking, I think of this unfettered expansion thing and all I think about is like grabbing all the toys and, <laughs> um, and getting it all for myself. Um, and to how do we combat that? How do we? Well, well you know, they say information is power, right? Mm -hmm. So if you limit the, the information by not seeking out, to, you know, to understand what's on people's minds, um, you are suppressing information and thereby, thereby hanging on to power, right? Mm -hmm. So power sharing would look like uh, lots of people having their full input um, and full stories being told instead of just... Um, you know, hearing one voice or one version of something, right? Yeah, which actually I think leads us really well into power hoarding, right? Yeah. Before you go away, I'm looking at the chat and uh, Wendy asked about um, the surveys, uh, some examples about qualitative around justice work and Jack wants to know about um, the percentage of congregations that have gone through capacity building activities. Um, so I know we have some of our UUA regional staff. Yes, honey. <laughs> and and honey. I think Maggie's on here too. Um, so uh, maybe they have some information, some resources to share. And I think that Wendy is a former ARE president. Is that who's down there, Wendy Von Zerplo, Von Quarter? Is Wendy Von Quarter in the house? Yep. 
Oh, oh my it, God, I got to step up my game. Anyway. She's, she's asking the question. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, oh, you're the, oh, she's, I, all I see is Wendy. I, you know, there's more than one way. So actually I do have, I do have an example. I have a couple of examples. I have them not on, on paper, but I might be able to get them on paper for you. Um, <laughs> but I find that qualitative questions like, um, so I did a, a recently I did an ARE drum uh, uh, regional conference actually about two years ago, and we put a lot of time into our our kind of post conference survey, and the questions were around: Did you feel safe? Did you feel that the people who were acting as essentially chaplains were were they accessible to you? Um, we asked how could like we we asked about levels of enjoyment so um if we kind of ask feeling oriented questions we find that we get actually some very interesting answers back um i think there's some quantitative you know how did you like the conference on a scale of one to ten that's not terrible to ask but um to really ask a lot of open-ended questions and direct them at more of a person's experience and and also to talk about what your goals with the conference were you know our goals were very very explicit as as facilitators in the conference our goals were explicit we wanted people to feel safe we had um we had um a caucusing space for both the white allies and the people of color and then within the people of color there were other caucus groups and we um, wanted people to feel safe. We wanted people to feel that that they were doing their thing, and then we would come together over courses of the conference. We asked about, did you feel there was enough interaction? Did you want more interaction? So it's kind of um, those kinds of qualitative questions. And I think also, there's one or two Carol surveys I might be able to access. Caroline, if I could just add to that, you know, we also, um, People appreciated that we built in networking time and just some fellowship time for folks. I remember that was a lot of what was important to people. So it goes back to that relationship thing and uh, getting stories of connections that people made um, were really important to people. Yes. So I don't want to ignore um, Jack's question about capacity building activities, how our congregations are doing with that. And I don't really have an answer. So, Connie, you're my person in this area. If there are others, if there's something that you could add to that, I don't, I don't have an answer for it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, what do you, what is Jack asking? Uh, qualitative have, I have no idea. I mean, capacity, I, capacity yeah, building activities. Organizations have done that. I, 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 I don't know. We could probably find that out, but um if you'd like to email me i'd try to ask some questions and see if i could find it out my email is really easy it's my name c goodbread <laughs> at ua.org it's very easy <laughs> so yeah so jack yeah okay i see jack's email great i'll see what i can find out all right. And Jack, I wonder if there's something behind the question that you think we should look at before we move on I'm not not really sure. We've been working slowly over the last two years or so to organically grow capacity within our congregation and also tie into efforts from the other congregations around us geographically. So we're trying to um, offer different training events and activities within the church itself to have people join in at their own pace and come along. And one of the things that we're trying to keep track of is how many people have participated over time. And uh, as we move towards a con congregational um, uh, agreement, because we're really, the way that I look at it is we're coming to a new covenant in, with our own congregation in this activity. And we want to make sure it's majority and we have wide, wide buy-in. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the best insight I can. Okay. There's um, 
when you talk about capacity building, I'm thinking about the intercultural um, competencies, um, the work that, that we did ARE's conference two, three years ago, um, and ministers worked, and I wondered how much it's come out into our congregations about understanding that capacity, understanding is built developmentally, you know, that sometimes we have only one way to access at one level, and, and if you're not at that level, you can't um, get there. So um, I think that's important to take in consideration also. Um, I have a question. Wendy had said um, to clarify, Jack, if you would, and I do want to get somewhere near our thing tonight, but she said, are you talking about capacity in the terms of anti-oppression work, anti-racism work, multiculturalism work, or are you talking about a broader um, capacity where you're just kind of like everybody is working at capacity? Well, one of the one of the things you brought up earlier was budgeting, and and really the the issue for us is personal. The most the most valuable thing is people's time. So an example of what we would say is growth in the congregation, a, a vigil last year, a year ago at Christmas was about 20 people. A vigil this year was 55 and was engaged with other churches and schools in the area. So, and then we have people involved in variety of activities like alternative to violence that are working in the prison system, people working legislative efforts. And so those things are building within the congregation as people are picking activities that uh, they're very attuned with. I'm mm. focusing it on religious education uh, to bring that into everyone's experience, especially helping the uh, young adults and children build a moral compass that includes these parameters. I hope that helped. I think so. Yeah, and I think, um, too, when the leadership of the congregation is open to um, people being engaged around where they're passionate, you know, is a way of power sharing, and it's um, it reinforces itself, right? So that's the way that you build capacity and sustainability over time. So Yeah, I agree. So and power sharing leadership. models, um, power sharing models, that I think, that's something that I find many, many people really struggle with because we are, we kind of do come into a very hierarchical, very kind of authoritarian view of things in, in our general life, in this society. Certainly, I recognize that Unitarian Universalism is not the Catholic Church, but we tend to have plenty of hierarchies of our own. And, um, and that it is a challenge, I think, for everybody, for all of us, um, to really, really focus on power sharing as kind of a foundational thing. Um, I think the best way we've done it on ARE is to really focus on, like, to try to make an effort to have not one person responsible for anything, that it's always a team of people. Um, not only to share the burden, right, but to share the authority and to share the power um, and to get used to um, the, the, like, kind of like the giving and taking of power in situations, right, in a very, very healthy way, in community, in accountability, and in right relationship. And I think if we focus on that in our personal lives, right, about sharing power as much as we can kind of across the board, then I think the, I think our communities start changing in relationship with that and become kind of healthier and more justice um, effective, right? Yeah, so, um the idea of power sharing kind of leads right into our next category, talking about paternalism or patriarchy. Um, where, you know, there's 
the we all understand what that looks like, right? There's a clear line of those who are in power, um, and we're less clear about those who don't have. Right? And, and that's on purpose. <laughs> Again, all of these elements of white supremacy culture are on purpose. They're designed to support the system. Um, so um, for those folks who, who are empowered, they know they're empowered to make decisions on behalf of anyone and everyone uh, in, in their interests uh, for the organization. And don't necessarily think it's important to check in with other people with differing viewpoints. Um, and uh, some people are just fine with that. <laughs> and for other folks, it can be very um, disturbing and disorienting and alienating, right? So, you know, that's why power sharing is, is so important, right? I have been on the receiving end of that <laughs> <laughs> so many times. Um, and I think, it's it's funny because I know sometimes why it is. I think I often appear a lot younger than I am. Um, and I have learned sometimes to keep my trap shut. So sometimes people don't think I know anything. Um, and so I have... I've experienced paternalism. I, I experience paternalism almost every day. And I think it's one of the things that struck me most when I first saw this analysis was that there is nothing more damaging to our relationship than when you talk down to me. There is nothing more, there is nothing that is just going to, I will lose all respect. You know, I think that, I don't know, you must think you're holier than thou. Um, and, and it is so easy at the same time to do. It is so easy for me to make the assumption that you don't know about this, that you don't have as much as I do, that you don't have as much power as I do, whatever, and kind of like talk down to people, you know, and, but I will tell you, I have been made to feel like I'm four years old more times than I care to count. The opposite of this I find is interesting because I find that people, and I know that somebody put something about don't abdicate your power, and I agree, don't abdicate your power, um, because I think the flip side of paternalism or patriarchy is people actually abdicating power. There are some people who are going to try and maintain their power and think they're above everybody else and kind of communicate that pretty damn effectively. And then there are people who are going to be like, I don't want to be accountable. I will let the leaders do that. We'll let the leaders take care of it. Let those people do it. I don't want to be the one who has to blah, blah, blah. And I find that that's a really interesting um, thing that we talk a little bit less about is that, you know, we get kind of mad when somebody talks down to us, but we are just as eager to throw everything else in somebody else's hands. Right. We talked a little bit about that last time about, you know, leadership oppression, right? We want leaders because some of, we don't want the responsibility. We want someone else to go and solve the problems. But as soon as, as there's a leader up there, you know, we tend to put a target on there. Um, and so, you know, it, you, it's kind of understandable why some leaders would just want to take all the power and make all the decisions because it's a lot easier if they don't have to check in with anyone. Right. <laughs> um, so it's, and, you know, our culture supports that. So it's very easy to fall into that trap. Um, and if you, um, you know, keep the decision-making process a secret, <laughs> it's a lot easier to tamp down any sort of questions um, and, um, you know, have to deal with potential conflicts and you can just keep plowing through, right? So. I, and one thing that, um when you just said that it's easier, right, to kind of make all the decisions and whatnot, that brings me back to, I know we were talking last week about sense of urgency, right? It takes a lot less time not to ask people what they think, right? It takes a lot less time to make the decision because you know better, right? Of course you know better. <laughs> You're the one making the decision. Um, it takes a lot longer 
to start asking questions and hearing all affected parties. Right. So that's how that kind of overlaps with paternalism, I think, also. Yeah. And that's really going to impact my sense of urgency. Right. <laughs> you know, you're slowing me down. <laughs> so so we have that sense of urgency for a reason. Right. That reinforces my paternalistic ways if I want to just keep going. So, you know, the antidotes to that are, um, you know, setting up models of accountability, of information sharing, um, you know, consensus building, um, and, and really uh, leadership development, right? So everybody understands their level of um, power and authority that they may have, you know, as an elected leader in a congregation, for example. Um, but also what their accountability is to the congregation. Um, and, you know, we have an interesting struggle in Unitarian Universalism <laughs> because we may not be the Catholic Church, but in a lot of ways we're the Catholic Church in the United States of America, um, considering how we were founded. And so we have a lot of that built in, but we also have a lot of anti-authoritarianism, you know, in our in our congregations. And, um, and also because of the culture of fear of authority. So it's, you know, it's, it's got us coming and going, <laughs> which also helps keep the system in place, right? Right. Um, I'm looking at what Wendy said about following and leading. You know, we, we will tend to um, not be able to step back, um, you know, that we think that we have to be stepping up all the time leading and there are certainly times that we just really need to be quiet and listen um i find that's probably one of the hardest things to do um in cross-cultural cross-racial you know look at how this has played out in this country in the last year and all the black lives matter yeah, it takes a certain amount of uh, humility, you know, and we're a very ego-driven culture. And um, so, you know, that's a spiritual growing edge, I think, that we have. Yes. For sure. um, and, you know, and again, just to sort of cap this one, um, to check in with the folks who you are accountable to, you know, in leadership. Um, Communication is a two-way street, right? And um, so think about practices and systems that you could set up that facilitate that two-way conversation. Um, uh, you know, I, we like to use a lot of town hall meetings in, in church. Um, Connie put up their small group meetings, small group ministries, that kind of thing are all kinds of ways to at least set up the practices to kind of grease the wheel or, or exercise the muscle of um, learning to communicate and feeling your own personal power <laughs> and ownership and sense of accountability, um, you know, in your congregation or in other groups. So. Yeah, so I am looking at the time and I am looking at what we've got left and I'm thinking we are doing dynamite on time. Yep, we're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I, I would love to kind of, if that's okay with um, Carrie and Donna, to kind of open it up if um, there are any thoughts or feelings or somebody wants to talk out loud instead of having to type. Um, we'd love to hear from you. We have only one right way. And we have um, objectivity, which is going to be fun um coming up and then we'll have a little bit of a wrap up so we have a little bit of space if um if people want to kind of bring in their own uh, thoughts and feelings and and are is the material challenging you or are you thinking it's like god's gift like i did eventually <laughs> <laughs> well i see karen posted in the chat you know that um about this allergy to followership is related to a culture of individualism, which, um, you know, we talked about a little last week. Um, and again, um, to borrow from Michelle Alexander from the new Jim Crow, uh, the bird cage of mass incarceration, and there's also a bird cage of white supremacy culture. And all of these wires, you know, fit together 
to make a cage for us to get stuck in this white supremacy thinking. Let's see, there's some more on the chat. The chat is like better than the conversation. <laughs> So Donna, I wanted to just it's not a competition. I muted you, but you can unmute yourself um, as soon as you need to. But we were getting a little bit of an echo. Uh, so maybe Carolina, we should forge ahead. Okay, let's do. I, I do want to just say sometimes people have a hard time finding their unmute button. So if we give another 15, 20 seconds, it might be helpful. Um, but this is the time, people, if you want to make a comment or question, for all ears. Um, I, I would like to just... Um ask if folks have had an opportunity to read any of the additional material that was on the um, on the posted document with all the hyperlinks and well, whether there's any stuff bubbling up from that. Is there stuff bubbling up for you, Anne? Well, yes. <laughs> so, um, and Laura heard me talk about this earlier today. I, I, I read through a couple of things, and um, included in that was the additional document out there that was that included um, Tema Okum's Ladder of Empowerment. And in reading it, and and understanding the stages and the stages isn't the right word understanding these steps and that you can you can move through them but very frequently will encounter events in your life that will cause you to tumble back um i i laid this down on paper and then sort of did a chronological progression of my life to see when i got to which step and when were those opportunities that I went tumbling back and was disappointed or surprised or, or, or um, tickled to learn where I was and when and, and also discovered that I spent about 30 years in one step. And um, that's half my life. So um, moved on. <laughs> but I thought that was a really interesting tool, um, and and if you haven't had a chance to read it, do it's it's a, a lot of words, but it's also um, resonated really well. Thank you, thank you for that observation. Um, what I found, um, and I, I love it. I think it's a really great tool. Oh, oh, okay. I love it. It's a really great tool. Um, uh, what I find is whenever I revisit it, I find that I am in all of the stages simultaneously. Like I can say, I can see where, and it, you know, it's relative to, to what's going on in my world. Like she says, you know, things will happen to us and we might fall back or whatever, but depend, you know, I can see where kind of in this headspace, I'm in a little bit shame and blame. And in this headspace, I've really evolved, you know? And so it's really interesting to identify that you kind of can be, you might in your general sensibility be kind of sort of in one place, but as a whole, you're always somewhere on that scale. So I do, I love, I, I quite frankly, I love her work. Um, and again, I, I don't, I do not know Tem Okun. <laughs> I don't. Um, but her book, The Emperor Has No Clothes was transformative for me. And that was what this material is based on. So, and it's the only way to do racial justice. <laughs> Cause there's only one right way. Cause there's only one right way. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I let me tell you, because last week we talked a lot about um, how how we can use this particular analysis not only as a a tool to evaluate where we are culturally um, and where we might be organizationally or institutionally, um, but also where we are personally. And let me tell you, I probably think I sense of urgency is a big one for me, but only one right way. Um, I am one of those kind of engineering geeks that's mathematical and precise and figures out the exact perfect right way to do things. And then that has to be it. And as, although I would never say to you my way or the highway, Carrie, ever, <laughs> <laughs> ever. Um, this is one that I find most challenging because as humble as I work at being and as humble as I often am, um, I am so convinced of my own rightness sometimes, um, especially with like quantitative stuff, but even with qualitative stuff too. Yeah, well, you know, we are the truth seeking people, right? So when we think we found the truth, we want to stick to it. <laughs> Um, and, uh, it's hard when we are seekers and, and we think we found it, um, not to stick with it, but I think, gosh, this tri trips us up in racial justice work all the time, you know, um, thinking about like, who's got the best analysis <laughs> and what's the right way to do this and what's, or more often, what's the wrong way, right? We get, um, our hands slapped a lot, um because someone thinks we're not doing it the right way, um, you know, separate from, um, you know, sort of causing more hurt or microaggressions. That's, that's a separate topic, but um, yeah, you know, there are a lot of different ways to go at this work. If there were one right way, I would hope that we would already know what it is and have done something about it, right? But we are all figuring this out. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the more thoughts and the more uh, ideas and the more creativity we can have, I think the better off we are. That's what we need to come to recognize. And that, uh, gosh, and today, I mean, think about our presidential politics and um, the polarization that is out there. That's just, um, talk about reinforcing white supremacy culture, right? Um, we need uh, all different uh, perspectives and thoughts and creativity working on these issues. Yeah, this, um, this really brings up for me, um, because I'm so stuck in only one right way, one of the things I've really learned, particularly through activism, um, is the idea of diversity of tactics. And I remember I've been in, in some nonviolent direct action trainings before, and they talk about diversity of tactics, and I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever, right? Like. And it always felt to me like you, you must just tolerate other people's way of doing things. But I've been in spaces now where I recognize that although I might, there, there, are, there are groups out there who are working towards the same end as we are, the same goal as we are. Um, let's just say, you know, Black Lives Matter activists who disrupt political conventions, right? Um, and I know that there have been a lot of feelings about that. I talk to a lot of white people who have a lot of feelings about, especially the disruptions early on. A couple happened here in Arizona with Bernie Sanders. And I, I look at that now and I go, no, no, no diversity of tactics. And I have been at protests where there are, let's say, kind of hardcore anarchist groups that take a lot more risks, that do things that I would not choose to do. But what they do is they essentially ensure media coverage and without media coverage or people who choose to get arrested, right? I, I may choose or may not choose to get arrested. It might not be my thing to do, right. but I will tell you, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And if there are arrests, you will see it on the news. And if you see it on the news, there's a possibility for somebody to get the message out to the larger thing. You may never choose to get arrested, but you might be somebody who could speak really well to an issue, you know, on the news. 
And as much as some people might frown on tactics that other people have, um, usually when they are more aggressive than we ourselves would choose, right? Um, we have to remember that it is all of us in, in concert, whether or not we made prearranged plans ahead of time, it's all of us in concert that are trying to move towards our goal of racial justice. So what I try and remember, if people use different tactics than mine um, or my groups, um, A, I have, I have the ability to engage in those or not, but um, they're doing a piece that needs doing, right? Um, it, in, from a non in a nonviolent context, let's just be clear about that. So, um, so that's, I think, a lot about diversity of tactics. And that's something, it's a challenge. Sometimes it's a challenge, but it's often, what, if we reinforce that amongst ourselves and in ourselves and in our organizations, sometimes that can be very, very powerful to combat only one right way. I've been watching the chat and I just want to lift up how important it is to inform ourselves of different ways of looking at a situation. Um, there's been talk about um, Black Girl Dangerous, Mia, and I'm not remembering Mia's last name. Mackenzie. Um, yeah. Um, you know, her analysis of the Newton shootings versus um, black children every day gave me such a stronger understanding of that, that we say your humanity is tied up in mine. You know, and sometimes it almost feels trite the way we say that. And so I just want us to always keep looking for ways to hear other people's experiences that ours aren't the only way. They're not the only right way. And mm -hmm. in talking about listening to people's experiences, I think that kind of leads us into our last, our last um, theme here, and that one is objectivity, um, because often when we are in conflict, a lot I hear is kind of like the conflict of information, right? Like these are my statistics. No, you have the wrong statistics, right? Um, and we come at things from a very, very objective perspective, or we believe objective perspective, and, and kind of shy away from hearing people's experiences and listening to, um, to more than what, is, what the information is telling us. And I think that brings back the importance of emotion in this work. So Donna, I know, has got a lot to say about that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm uh, was monitoring the chat instead of um, listening so much. Yeah, um, Carolina and I went round and around that I thought we should have started with objectivity because the uh, the whole way of invalidating other people's experience and, and shutting down their emotions and telling them, you know, either telling them or just denying them um, that they should have those emotions, not listening, um, is, um, you know, th it, that dichotomy between objective and subjective, you, you have to keep understanding that there's not, that your way is not the objective way and that's all there is. Um, yeah, I'm somebody who tends to be very, very tied to linear and logical thinking. I, I'm very, very tied to it. Um, it's been a challenge for me to 
Um, but I'll tell you what, I've been looking at the chat screen. Um, and now we have a screen share. Woo. Um, we, I've been looking at the sc chat screen, and there's something that's actually confused me, um, which I think was Carol, by... are you intending to do that? Huh? I'm just... Carol, are you intending to share your screen? I don't know. I'm trying to find my way to a uh, link that I wanted to share myself with you, but that may not happen right now. So, Carolina. So I just, I, I see in the chat screen, so where did it go? Where did it go? Yeah, um, um, Carol, can you um, stop sharing, yeah, your screen? Yeah, and then oh, yes, the, you could put... Where is it going, though, when it says share? No oh, idea. Here we go. Um, it goes stop. to all of us. We see it all. Oh, <laughs> all, <laughs> my all my windows? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to you. ask you about one of those, Carol. <laughs> Connie Goodbrand. <laughs> um, so, so Connie, Connie Goodbrand said, and to whose glory are we doing justice work? Which I haven't read the whole thread, so I don't even know what context that is. I would like Connie Goodbread to, to tell me more about that question. I would like to know what that is about. Well, I think for Unitarian Universalists, <clears throat> often we come at, <clears throat> at uh, justice work with the Lady Bountiful idea that we've got <clears throat> what those people need, uh, rather than saying we haven't got a clue what the heck is going on here? And we're not going to be the people bleeding in the streets, so we should be paying more attention to what is happening outside of us and, and not just do the thing that makes us look good or even the thing that we want to do, but the thing that needs to be done. And so I'm constantly, you know, asking, as uh, in groups, and so why are we doing this? Uh, to to whose glory is this for? Is this for us? You know, I mean, so we can just feel really good about ourselves, and you know, or are we really doing this because it's what the community needs? So, as servant leaders, do we do what do we serve? Um, and so, I I always go into to whose glory um, are we about to do this? Thank you. That is bizarrely a metaphor I have never heard. Um, but I think what you just said, right, that's the embodiment of patriarchy. That is thinking we know better than everybody else. And, you know, that translates to what is often joked about um, snarkily as the white savior complex, right, particularly when we're talking about racial justice. Um, and I love that. And thank you for bringing that in. Um, I don't know if Temu Kun pushes that enough. We need to kind of look in the mirror and say, you know, what, what is motivating me? You know, um, and um, I know what used to motivate me. I know what motivated me after that. I know what motivates me now. Um, and I think that and that's one of the reasons I love this piece as a, a reflective tool, because this is something I come back to and I say, where is paternalism showing up in me, right? Um, it can help me analyze what's going on around me equally well, but when I get, I don't want to say uncomfortable, because I recognize now the difference between discomfort and off balance, right? Um, so when I get off balance, I go, okay, now, like, I know there's something probably here that is making me off balance. So I love that you brought that in. Thank you so much. So Donna. Are we done with objectivity? Does anybody have anything to say about objectivity? So can I be heard right now? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yes, this maybe. Is, this I'll is... think about it. <laughs> I love you. Power. Uh, 
<laughs> so I, I was starting to type, but I couldn't type fast enough. I wanted to say that I, I really, first of all, appreciate you all doing this, but appreciate Connie's call to be sure that what we're doing is what's being asked of from the, the community. And that's why I hear us talking about accountability and all that. But I want to raise another aspect. Um, and, and I'm so appreciative of the way Connie phrased that about uh, to whose glory, because in these cross-cultural situations, I know with the, the immigrant work in particular, there is a call to a higher power that we might feel discomfort with in some cases too. And I think that that's one of the pieces where we also need to, to tread with great humility and remember that, that even if we are with a group that, that claims a right way and a one way, about one aspect of that, in the, in the case of um, the immigrant community, sometimes a lot of Catholicism, I think that we, we need to learn how to navigate that well too. And, and that's an important piece of that accountable relationship. So I hadn't thought about it in that way until you asked the question in that way, Connie, because I think that that, that language might be experienced differently, right? And we need to be in touch with what, what's calling us to do it but also deeply respected, respectful of what might be calling other people across cultures to do the same work. I think that we don't like going there sometimes because it makes us uncomfortable. And now I'll just be quiet. So um, one of the comments actually talks about and raises up the question of the discomfort versus being off balance. Carolina, could you say a few more words about how, how you were able to discern the difference eventually between your discomfort and being off balance and what that indicates for you? I knew I shouldn't have gone in that direction. <laughs> um, I think, hmm. So I think that the one thing that I really, really learned to understand first um, was kind of the the difference between discomfort, even extreme discomfort, and actual risk. Um, and that is, that's sometimes hard for people who are unaccustomed to discomfort at all. Because even the littlest discomfort could make us go kind of a little panicky. Um, so, so, Understanding the difference between discomfort and risk was helpful for me to then realize, am I just uncomfortable or um, am I, is there something really threatening me, right? Um, and that, we can talk a little bit about gut instinct in that sense. I think, I think some of us tend to go with our gut on that and I do too. Um, but also how much of my discomfort, I think, you know what here, I think this is the best way I would put it. If my discomfort is impacting my behavior and my intention, um, if I'm starting to react as opposed to be present and respond, then I know I'm not only uncomfortable, but I'm also off balance. So I can just be uncomfortable and sit here and go, wow, I'm really uncomfortable. Or I can get, or I can get snappy or I can be like, oh my God, when is this going to be over? Um, then I'm feeling a sense of urgency. Oh my God, what an idiot, right? That's off balance. That's when I'm already, I'm passing judgment on people. That's not me being uncomfortable with the fact that I'm in a room full of white people that are asking questions that often make people of color uncomfortable. And that's really uncomfortable for me as a white person. That's discomfort. Um, but when I start dismissing um, or kind of noticing where my headspace is, I hope that helps a little bit in, in how I discern that. And I wanted, I, can I follow up, please? I just want to say, Wendy, thank you. Um, now I've forgotten what you said. Um, but I think, no, I now I remember. I, I have found in Unitarian Universalism in particular, but not, not only, um, 
this incredible discomfort, you know, many of us come from a humanist standpoint. And then here we are doing, it, uh, particularly with migrant justice, work in communities where there is a Catholic background or maybe a Christian background, um, where, where there is a, 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 like a conviction behind that, that, um, that makes us very uncomfortable. And, and many of us have maybe even decided that that sort of a worldview is superstitious. Um, and to hold somebody as an equal and as valid and as respectable and um, with, with that challenge, right? It's a challenge. It's a challenge for me when people believe things that I think are kind of ludicrous. Um, that is, I think, the best articulation of the struggle that many of us have doing this work in depth. So I wanted to thank you for bringing that in. So we've got uh, about 12 minutes left. Um, does anybody else have any comments or questions on the stuff we've gone over? We have a few minutes of wrap up that we'd like to share, but before we do that, anybody? I think the objectivity subjectivity thing is so very important for me and I'll just speak for just a moment on kind of some of uh, what kind of raised my consciousness and moved me along the ladder, so to speak, uh, was back in my early 20s, just being around uh, Charlene Teeters uh, at the University of Illinois when she started to organize uh, the communities there, the indigenous communities to fight Chief Illiniwick, you know, the representation of the university by a racist mascot. And me having no idea, you know, growing up in a small town, just thinking, oh, I'm gonna become a fighting Illini, you know, just thinking that was like the pinnacle of what you do, you know, <laughs> when you can afford to go to a public land grant university and that's the one that's around in Illinois. And just, in the course of six to eight months, the work she and the community did there, the public awareness work and the direct action work at football games, I, I'm, I moved from that objectively just thinking, no, Chief Illiniwick is respectful and why, why don't you understand this, to that, that place of subjectivity and understanding that my truth is not the only truth and also understanding that um, it, just developing the empathy, I think, is what it was. The whole idea of just seeing it from another person's perspective, a person's perspective who I just had no, no frame of reference for before they started those dialogues and that, and that kind of confrontational direct action at the football games. So it, it kind of was playing itself out, and I'm very grateful to them for that because it moved me along to a place where I could now be here 20-plus years later. It kind of rocks your world when you yeah. uh, encounter it, right? <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> so it just seems like it, it's, talk about an iterative, iterative process. You have to keep reminding yourself over and over again that what you think is real <laughs> and objective and stable is not necessarily. That is so true. So true. Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> Very well said. Thanks, Lori. So, Carolina, are you going to, anybody else before we move to wrapping up? How do you like are this? Any other, any other questions or any other um, stories? Um, that you'd like to share. Stories are a good thing to share, either personal or of your congregation and where you are um, in doing this work. Uh, this is Jack again. Sorry uh, I, to speak so often, but we formed a racial justice working group, it's, and we're pretty new to it. It's about two years. Uh, that we've been working as a group. Um, previous to that, we had a lot of support from the North, what's now the Northeast region with Met Groot 
and uh, the what's called the Grace Group that's out of there. Um, we originally got involved in this uh, and had to pull back because we really needed to make the change that in our congregational congregational family organic, and that required us to slow down a lot. Um, individuals keep in. We have individual groups that are very active. Um, I'm interested in multicultural and immigration, but also RE, that is education. Uh, others have been involved for years in the prison system in our group, and uh, we try to line up with the other uh, UU churches in the region and also some of the non-UU churches and be respectful in that relationship. Uh, so if Again, we, we internally, we think about this a lot like the change to going a welcoming uh, congregation, which probably took us five years to get to some 20 years ago and took us a long time afterwards to internalize that process. And sometimes we go back and say we're missing and have to we're reinvestigating that. But at least we have that model. So we, you know, not just the ministers, but the deacons, the community and trying to provide multiple opportunities for engagement and uh, education and allow the congregation to speak and engage. So we're, I don't know if you, we use that as a model, we're two years into a five year process, but not trying to pull people back from action external to the church because we're trying to both be internal and externally directed. I think that summarizes where we are. Sounds great. That is, I think that's great. And it's one of the, the things that I was going to talk about and wrap up. So that kind of feels like it leads right in there for me. Um, I, I encounter in, actually my great fortune has been to encounter a lot of people who are struggling with this work. Um, within Unitarian Universalism and also outside of Unitarian Universalism. Um, I've had the fortune to have have many a conversation with people who are equally frustrated, as frustrated as I am, um, but also who, um, who are struggling with how to manage to do this work inside their congregation still. Um, sometimes the rest of the congregation isn't quite ready um, or is not as ready as maybe they are. Let's put it that way. Um, so I think what, what I tend to advise people is it, you can't force it. And I'm glad you said, you know, that you're working on it, you know, as an organic process, Jack, because you can't force it. Um, I'm a bulldozer. Um, I have learned uh, this is not one thing that I can bulldoze my way into. Um, so I tell people, do this work. Do it outside your congregation. Bring it inside your congregation. Take it outside your congregation. Bring it back inside your congregation. Um, be a catalyst. And I, I love hearing that that's kind of one of the tracks you're on. Um, and then I tell people, self-educate, self-educate, self-educate. We cannot, um, I think one of the real dangers of white supremacy culture is we kind of get to this place where we've been, you know, we know enough to do the thing and then we do the thing like crazy and we lose sleep and we don't see our friends and we don't do self-care very well. Um, and we don't continue to educate ourselves. This is, this is like a college education every day. So that's one thing I have to keep mindful of is that I need to keep self-educating all the time, all the time, every day. Um, and then I say, um, so often this work is a struggle. Um, so often it feels like I'm going over, off a cliff or somebody else is going off a cliff. Um, help, help keep people from going off a cliff, whatever that might mean for you. So, 
And that's, you know, relationships are important. And I'll turn it over. My, my, my cohorts can wrap up just fine. I think I've talked enough. So Carolina talked a lot about how justice work is internal work. Um, you know, it's not just outward, outwardly focused. Um, it's about doing your own work, um, paying attention, being aware, um, being mindful, being intentional. Um, it's important to challenge our assumptions, you know, going into this work and when we encounter um, folks, other folks who are doing this work, and in different situations, we talked a little bit about, you know, working in multicultural, multiracial groups. Um, so we need to kind of keep an open mind there um, and challenge assumptions not only in yourself, but in others, too. Don't be afraid to, um, you know, be an ally that way to one another. We talked about uh, the necessity of humility that kind of goes hand in hand with forgiveness. Again, if we knew the clear roadmap to uh, get into the promised land, we would have gotten there hopefully by now. So we are all human. We are all going to make mistakes. Uh, nobody knows the right way. Um, so we have to counter that, um, that thinking that we have to be perfectionism that we talked about last time. Um, choosing to go ahead, Donna. Keep listening. Keep listening to the people that are around us and that we want to be in relationship. There's been a lot of talk about seventh generation. Um, I, I had a young black woman at a Sandra Bland rally recently talk about that. Um, you know, this is long work. This is hard work. We're in it for the long haul. And uh she said you know if you're here for the photo op no so that gets back to that that um connie said you know we what are we doing it for and it really is to build a beloved beloved community beyond what we have known there's so much more um that we can be when we all keep doing this work and supporting each other. Yeah, and I guess, you know, always um, we, we uh, from thanks to the standing on the side of love, love shirts, <laughs> you know, we are the love people. And so we want to choose to engage from a place of love and courage uh, when we do this work. And hopefully... This gathering of all these folks over these last couple of weeks will give you courage because you know that you're not alone. So, yeah, whoever said, let's all have lunch, yeah. <laughs> Supporting each other. There was someone raising their hand. Lori, did you see that? Can you um, fix Jen, uh, Jean Helms? meaning to take the hand down <laughs> i was just clapping <laughs> oh was that clapping i'm saying yeah. here here clapping okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right well i no. i like clapping as as a wrap-up i do <laughs> um so yeah i love that you are not alone i think that's such a beautiful way to close out um thank you everybody for joining us Lori, do you have any yeah. last stay tuned on the Facebook event we will post a video of this and you can share it with people who you know might be interested who couldn't make it tonight we'll also repost the link to the resource directory and on the rest of the webinars we're gonna put in different folders there as well any additional resources that happen uh, to be mentioned or used throughout the workshops so um, go ahead Donna, I think I have a real quick question. Um, can can the hyperlink to the resource directory either be placed in a document in the Facebook page or pinned to a post in the Facebook page so that we can find it and don't have to keep scrolling through emails or whatever to try to find it? 
Yeah, I'm going to put it in the Facebook event. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Gina, I like that. We are all one. We forget that so often that we think we are isolated beings and doing this work in a vacuum and without each other. And I have just loved this format of us being able to see each other's faces and talk about where we are. Strength and courage to keep doing this wonderful work of love. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I look forward to having many, many more conversations with yes. you all. Yes. Yes. Bye now. Bye-bye.